Indian philosophy, everything begins with the forest. While in Islamic and Christian ideas, everything begins with nothingness. In the beginning, there was nothing, and then there was God, and then the world comes into being. Mm. In Indian thought, it always begins with the forest. Unlike a Bollywood film that one I am exposed to mostly, I find a hero who is not fair, who is dark, uh, uh, aggressive, uh, petulant, childlike, doesn't treat women respectfully. but somehow that is supposed to be cute and endearing and in the south indian film vocabulary that has always been the case and i think this film sort of very cleverly uses a traditional narrative to raise issues of environment to raise issues of uh, forest encroachment land rights and at the same time very cleverly uses the right to be uh, to promote its film so i think the cl- the filmmaker is an extremely clever man who has got the right wing to do what they do best marketing i saw some comments by you know all kinds of brahminical surnames there saying that this is the reality of india the great india and i'm like you know what <laughs> this film is making fun of you this whole idea of varaha being important as a central deity is a very early second third fourth fifth century uh, idea till seventh century almost but panjurli is a very local Tulu Nadu deity and to equate it with Brahminical deities is a bit um, well. I guess it makes political sense and it's uh, nice to be part of a larger club. This Tumbar Kantara debate that has started very recently, I think, for the last two days. What do you feel about that? Because Tumbar is also one film which we really love. Uh, so all these conversations are people throwing in their own agenda. Who feel you know if you're an atheist then. religion the superstition you know yeah but what people don't realize uh, people who say these things don't realize that justice is also a superstition <laughs> equality is also a superstition you know there is no justice in the world you believe it's a performance of justice that happens in the court the judges are the priests just like the bhuta kolam performer hello friends Welcome to Filmcopath. Today we are here for a very interesting discussion. If you have gone through our reviews of Kantara on the channel, you would know how much we have loved the film. But let me confess here that it wasn't a unanimous vibe within our team. Tumpy had reservations towards the film, which he has voiced on his social media. Also, some of our biggest supporters of the channel had problems with the film and reached out to us to talk about it. All of that demanded a bigger discussion on the film and the politics of Kantara. and someone who can provide us the right kind of perspective that this complex topic demands and guess what we have got the best person who could have done that devdat patnayak renowned author speaker illustrator and mythologist is someone whom all of us has loved and respected for long his writings have always given us the same perspective that the society demands differentiating between the letters of the rule and the spirit of the rule as the need of the hour devdat ji thank you for joining us today to discuss kantara and its various motives Thank you so much, sir, for your time and consideration. Welcome to Filmopad. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, before going into you know the talking about the film, I just wanted to talk about um, if you could just talk about the background of you know the Bhuta Kolas or the Devas that uh, of the Tulu Nadu that we watch in the film. If you could just give us some background because it would be a pleasure to hear from so you. So this, so this is a ritual practice that you find in the southern part of Karnataka. in the northern part of kerala in the coastal region it's a coastal practice it is uh, so even in kerala you find a form of it where it is called thaivam or thayyam mm. so thayyam dhaivam they all ve- crudely c- connect with the word dev which means god it is also the word bhuta bhuta means spirit and uh, basically um, these are rituals where there is a uh, god speaks now this human being usually belongs to what is called the lower strata of society um and uh, they will have to go through a whole bunch of ritual practices before the deity enters their body this includes um fasting uh fasting for many days uh it vigil and after which they have to go through an elaborate uh, transformation with costumes with the um, makeup and the whole thing charges then then the music is played in the middle of the night and a lot of uh, lamps are lit camphor is lit 
so it creates a kind of a trance like situation in which the individual identity disappears and it is believed that the gods talk through them to the general public and um, the that becomes the deity at the time so even though the person on his uh, in a regular way would be considered a lower caste person mm. when he becomes a deity he becomes higher than the higher caste and everybody falls at the feet and they sort of negotiate manious problems of social society problems questions are asked to them which they answer they give views opinions judgments you find this as i said in tulu nadu area you find it in north kerala um so that's basically the ritual that is been discussed in the film right right and now let me come to you know this elephant in the room <laughs> the the conflict of our uh, within the team as well as what we have found in our audience and now you know twitter has taken it to a different proportion altogether so uh, there there's one side where it says about the um, cinematic quality of the film uh, the performance by rishabh shetty as well as uh, you know the different motives like you were expressing and there's also one side of thought process that it's regressive it kind of giving a new excuse to superstition and uh, it is continuation of you know the religious propaganda that kind of is in the country so what was your feeling when you watched the film and if you talk about talk about that please no so everybody see a film is a film and we appreciate the film for what the director wants to communicate yeah uh, a film a director is not obliged to listen to the audience and because and do what the audience tells him to do because then it is not a work of art then it is a work of propaganda right uh, a work of art is where the where the where the filmmaker wants to express himself and he, this filmmaker has expressed himself through a film which follows a typical commercial vocabulary uh it's a completely commercial film there is nothing uh, he doesn't hide that at all yeah however what is unique in this story uh, i mean i'm not as familiar with a lot of south indian films but unlike a bollywood film that one i am exposed to mostly i find a hero who is not fair who is dark who is not conventionally handsome he doesn't have the six pack ab he is not perfect he drinks he uh, gets involved in fights in many ways it is like the hero of pushpa so that is a very standard trope that you find in south indian films mm. one of the things you notice in south indian films the heroes do come from socio economic strata lower socio economic strata they usually uh, come from rural backgrounds these are things that you don't find in uh, bollywood films which is more urban where the people are more fair usually punjabi usually urban uh, with names like gupta and singh and you know those kind of names you find this is a very different ecosystem and you find the hero is not perfect he is a rowdy again you find that in the film like pushpa uh, aggressive uh, petulant child like um doesn't treat women respectfully but somehow that is supposed to be cute and endearing and in the south indian film vocabulary that has always been the case the mothers mm. are stereotypical so there is nothing unique about the characterization of the story um what is interesting in this film is how subtly the politics is being played out you find the politics between upper caste and lower caste you find the politics between upper class and lower class between tribal communities and agricultural communities between the state the subtle conflict between the brahmanical ideologies and the non brahmanical ideologies caste is very clearly told ever in your face it is not trying to come in your face but it is very clarifying that these are low caste people who are considered impure not allowed to enter the house who are not allowed to there is uh, i mean it's a in a in a ecosystem where people with fish eating are also now considered <laughs> dirty you have got uh, uh, a hero who eats fish who likes to eat pork who enjoys chicken when was the last time you saw that in any film today in the last 5 7 years so all this is very interesting um, which comes across and of course the central theme of the film is this is a boy from the family of these daiva bhutakolam practitioners and he's skeptical about this he has lost faith in it doesn't know how to deal with it he comes to terms with it and finds his answer because it is an unsolvable problem 
which is solved through a supernatural or well not solved at least seems seemingly resolved by a supernatural entity that's all the film is about uh, so all these conversations are people throwing in their own agenda who feel you know if you're an atheist then religion is superstition you know yeah but what people don't realize uh, people who say these things don't realize that justice is also a superstition <laughs> equality is also a superstition you know there is no justice in the world you believe it's a performance of justice that happens in the court the judges are the priests just like the bhuta kolam performer the judge is the priest and you hope and remember the question that is asked to the bhuta kolam by the landlord is it you speaking or is it the god speaking and that's exactly we can ask the judges right is it you speaking or the law speaking so you can use exactly the bhuta kolam conversation in the supreme court with the judges just because they are wearing black robes they are also wearing costumes they are also their temple is designed in a particular way there is a performance going on this assumption that religion is superstition and the courts and the justice system or marxist ideology is not superstition is a very 19th century idea and we have to outgrow it in the post structural world that we live in we cannot apply these ridiculous divisions and binaries like left wing and right wing because each one is coming up with their own politics and i think this film sort of very cleverly uses a traditional narrative to raise issues of environment raise issues of uh, forest encroachment land rights and at the same time very cleverly uses the right wing uh, to promote its film so i think the cl- the filmmaker is an extremely clever man who has got the right wing to do what they do best marketing right and and i have been telling this to my friends i mean we do not have problems with uh, a horror story right uh, which is which is kind of an continuation of the alternate facet of religion the bhut you know it, it's the other side of religion or you know uh, the god but then uh, why should we t- talk about only in the way it is talking about religion because it's not provocative it's not fundamentalist and religion you know there are so many things as you say uh, it's not only about institutionalized religion which is the religion justice is also a religion yeah see the thing is many people assume that justice is rational thought equality is rational thought human rights are rational thought none of them are rational thoughts right and even rational thought is not rational thought so you know so this is an assumption that people have it's a very old humanistic enlightenment assumptions which were very valid 19 in the 1950s but we don't live in the 1950s we live in the and most books are written on these topics are 1950s books so nowadays notions of structure absence of structure what is superstition can be challenged at so many different levels and therefore one has to be very careful of where is one coming from and what is one trying to say you know if a film has a happy ending we'll say it's unrealistic if it has an unhappy ending we will say oh that is true because its tragedy is true but uh, comedy is false so these are all people's opinions of these things these i mean you should like, experience a picture for what it is and i feel this picture has used a cultural motif to raise issues which are very real uh, which are um, related to land and property rights land rights indigenous rights um states intervention capitalism uh, as well as divinity religion and the most funny thing is that it is being promoted by the people who really do not realize that the film is mocking them <laughs> yeah that's so the, that's the, pro- really the great promoters of the film don't realize that uh, you know the film is anti brahmanical it is making fun you know the king who is unhappy is not getting so less in the i don't know if you see the initial part of the movie when the king yes. is unhappy he goes yes. to a typical brahmanical guruji and he falls at his feet but that doesn't work it only the solution comes from an indigenous deity who mm. demands the forest be left alone so that itself is a powerful metaphor the what the deity is saying you will get peace of mind when you leave the forest alone now that's a powerful statement being made uh so i think and who is promoting the film people who think that the gurujis and the acharyas and who talk, who really celebrate the brahmanical establishment who have never heard of butakola who don't realize that the performers are treated with disdain by the brahmanical community 
um, you know, these are the people who are promoting the film. So, you know, the sh- I saw some comments by, you know, all kinds of Brahminical surnames there saying that this is the reality of India, the great India. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> this film is making fun of you. You just have to see the surname of the people who are promoting this film. And you realize, oh my God, these are the people who put Gomutra on these performers. <laughs> Right. Good that you bring out the point about the king. I had wanted to discuss about this. So this king does not get solace anywhere and he finds it in the forest in the demigod. And he also kind of wants to bring it home. So uh, I, I was just wondering, you know, if that feudal system is also being established over there, why will the king bring something home and then only find at peace? Why can't he visit it in the forest and be at peace with it? No, uh, this is a, a very old tradition. If you go to these regions, you will find outside the uh, houses of across Tulunadu, you will find houses. There is a little house kept outside the gate of the house, where which is called the house of the Buddha. And there'll be a knife there or an axe there or a mask there or a cloth there. And it is said the original occupant of the land is worshipped over there. The assumption okay. being that even before you claimed any forest or any land, somebody lived this part. This practice is in some form found across India where they will. That is the reason you have what is called Graha Pravesh Puja or Vastu Shanti Puja, where you'll always say that there is a previous owner of the land. Whichever mm-hmm. land you claim, there has been someone who lived before you on that land. And this is a very important Indian idea. And this is what they're showing over there. The point is the king is being told you not claim the forest which means you will not use it for agricultural purposes, which is what brings peace to him. So peace is when he returns returns the property to its forest state. So that's a very powerful statement being made. Let leave the forest alone. You will not touch the forest as far as my voice is carrying. Hmm. He says, as, as when I shout, as far as the sound, you will not touch the forest. And it's really a conflict between agricultural communities and indigenous communities, which is the big idea in the story, I feel. Right. So I wanted to ask you about uh, what you feel about the forest officer character played by Kishore. He's shown to be a sane voice of a non-believer who for most of the film works like a villain. What do you feel about that particular character? I don't know if he's a sane voice. He's the voice of the state. And he is trying to uphold the law. But he also has his own personal discomfort with this man who doesn't value the law. Because the our hero is a person of the forest and he doesn't understand why the state exists. He is it is a very beautifully visualized where the forest officer has no emotional connect with that forest. He has no, he's just given the duty of working over. He has no emotional connection. He is just there to follow the law of the land, a land and a constitution that doesn't make sense to the local village people. So much so when the local village person gets a job through whatever means, he says, well, you are a student person of influence. You've got the job through influence. So he resents that, not realizing that lady belongs to that community. And Mm. therefore, how the state, like a person is appointed by Delhi to work is legitimate, but a person who belongs to that land is not legitimate. So that is a very powerful statement being made. Although interestingly, it's a woman who's taking up a job and not a man. And the the character could have been a male character, but they choose a female character getting job. The fact that when she says how much she's going to earn money, the guy says, well, then, then it's fine. So the monetary economy has been brought in. I don't know whether the filmmaker thought it in this way, the way I'm explaining it. Maybe he's just intuitive. He's very intuitive. Or he, because uh, we are deconstructing the film, but yeah. most film creators may not even realize why they are creating these characters. They do it very, and that's what makes them great filmmakers. They don't consciously think the way we deconstruct the story. They do it what intuitive, but the fact that that is a very powerful combination because he is not attached to the soil. He has no emotional connection with the soil. I, as I said, I don't think he's sane or insane. And he's also irritated with these people. He finds them to be uh, barbarians. He finds them breaking the law. While these people don't see them breaking the laws. For thousands of years, we have been going to the forest and we have been collecting wood and herbs from these forests. You are the people coming up with these laws saying you can do this, yeah. you can't do this. 
so for the indigenous community they don't understand the laws of the land they have always been there so um, these ideas are very very radical he pre- but very gently pre- presented in the story the personal rivalries the uh, you know with this man that he's not into the state and the guy doesn't get it he says why should i i don't understand what the state is doing for me that i have to follow the state so that's an interesting character because how is the state benefiting these people until the last he says when he realizes that he's being taken for a ride till then he doesn't realize who is the victim he is genuinely under the assumption that the indigenous people the local people are the villains and then right. he realizes they're the victims uh, but he's just following the rules and the law and the rules or can be manipulated as the lawyer character presents that i can twist mm. anything so i yeah. think each character is archetypal in the picture so it's i think that is the reason it is such a powerful reach it's it's an unusually archetypal movie which is very difficult to create easy to create such films and i i think i think the guy has done it intuitively i don't i mean i would I don't know him at all but uh, if he has done this very consciously it will be a, it's a unbelievable work but i think it's an intuitive from what he has interviewed lit one two i read somewhere he said no i just narrated the story which means it's an intuitive understanding and grasp of life which makes him a great filmmaker right right also also this character i kind of perceived uh, so it's like you know uh, we do not have enough empathy towards the other side of you know uh, thinking like a believer would not be empathizing with a non believer and likewise and that kind of a tussle that comes within unnecessarily where someone else is reaping the benefits out of this tussle which we are seeing all around us i guess yeah so it is that famous panchati right where two otters are fighting over a fish and a fox comes to help them and then the fox takes the biggest part of the fish while the otters are left with the head and tail so that is the uh, this theme is also there in other films um uh, we are dealing with forest communities they typically have this kind of film that uh, sherni i think film had a similar theme yeah um uh, there was another film that uh, uh, newton newton yeah the same director i think who made Sher- sherni and amit masur wala the yes. indigenous community state and people taking advantage of the because the state is not personally connected with that land and the people who are connected with the land have no say in the matter and then therefore the person takes advantage of this divide between indigenous community who are connected to the land but have no power and the people with power who are disconnected from the land and then comes the middleman who realizes there is an opportunity for me uh, to generate uh, uh, wealth and power for myself and so that structure is a common structure that you find across filmmakers right because from the first itself he always tries to order these guys he never tries to make them realize what might they be doing wrong yeah and um, his whole tonality is of authority right he comes yeah. without realizing where is his authority coming from these authorities come from these people so where does state get its power from it gets from people you serve people you don't order them out so mm. this idea is beautifully brought out in this character so it's a very clever use of the film he is ordering them he is not talking to them um uh, he's talking at them he's not talking to them he is not engaging with them uh yeah. so those are interesting ideas you can see the side characters who are more friendly mm. speaking in the local language being fr- negotiating the boundaries that kind of maturity he lacks completely right uh devdu ji want to talk about uh, panjurli uh, just wanted to hear from you about the significance of the bore that we watch in the film in our mythology uh, we have come across the, the great ar- the article in hindu about it but if you could touch upon it uh, for our audience please yeah so panjurli is i mean the le- local bhutaganastic many forms one of them uh, there's jumadi there's panjurli there is different there uh, uh, pili there is the tiger the wild boar there is an androgynous character female body male head lots of various characters are there they are ancestral spirits perhaps or forest spirits um, uh, and the uh, interesting thing about a wild boar is a wild boar is Uh, a very sacred animal in karnataka area the wild boar was a symbol of the chalukya empire wild boar uh, so panjurli and there are these stories connecting it with hindu uh, deities like shiva shivaganas 
bhutaganas that and but these are appropriatory they, they are not brahmanical ideas they, they have been a, they come within the brahmanical fold as brahmanism spread from north to south india and i think that most people don't realize that brahmanism emerged in north india and it gradually spread like buddhism and jainism to other parts of india and it sort of realigned itself based on local realities and therefore many of these gods became Uh, sort of connected in some way or the other to uh, shaivism vaishnavism shaktism and the other brahmanical traditions uh, but the song varaha roopam becomes popular and therefore suddenly panjurli is equated with varaha and therefore vaishnav traditions um, uh, and that's a very clever ploy again because panjurli is a local bhuta deity it is not connected with vaishnavism it's not connected with uh, varaha these ideas of varaha is really seen in central india mostly um, the uh, in gupta period the kings used to be associated with varaha avatar rescuing the earth from foreigners um, so that was the co- very big concept in around second and third century ad so if you see in madhya pradesh area you find these gigantic statues of Bar- varaha uh, which are not there in other parts of india as much then you of course the temples in part of vaishnav tradition is there but vaish uh, this whole idea of varaha being important as a central deity is a very early second third fourth fifth century uh, idea till seventh century almost even in kashmir and um, it's uh, some of the dharma shastras are associated with it it's even earlier you find it in the brahma brahmana literature which is vedic literature which speaks of something like a emusha or a wild boar which is linked to prajapati not to vishnu so the wild boar is related to prajapati in the vedic scriptures in the puranas is associated with vishnu uh, the vedic scriptures are gajetic varaha is central indian and by the time it comes down south with vaishnavism the kaveri river is a very strong uh, delta of delta uh, i mean the, uh, where um, vaishnavism is very big uh, and that's where varaha becomes important but panjurli is a very local tulu nadu deity and to equate it with brahmanical deities is a bit um, well i guess it makes political sense and it's uh, nice to be part of a larger club but panjurli remains a tulnadu deity very strongly a tulnadu deity and it must its local nature must not be it cannot i mean if you go to assam and say panjurli nobody will understand what it means if you go to manipur nobody will understand what it means if you go to kashmir nobody will understand what it means even in karnataka many parts of karnataka they won't know it it is but in tulnadu the moment you say it they'll immediately have an emo- emotional response to it because it's traditionally connected who is the wild boar now the wild boar is important because the domesticated pig is a descendant of the wild boar just like you know wolf and dogs are connected yeah. to each other yeah. the wild boar is in many ways connected with the uh, domesticated pig now the thing is indians don't eat pork and domesticated pig are considered dirty and they are associated with low caste people in india i don't know if you have seen a very famous marathi movie called fandri Actually, yes. became a yep. very success and there it shows how pig is a link to dirt and out outside the the dalit that is how it is very beautifully and very disturbingly presented this is a wild boar which is a royal creature hunting wild boars was a royal sport so i think the the varaha also represents this tension between the forest and the land the wild and the uh, in the jungle there is nothing like pure and impure but the moment you come into the city you have something called a pure and impure and in the city or in the village the impure is the pig so it's a very powerful symbol again as i said again the filmmaker uses a powerful symbol uh, to communicate ideas this is the reason the film is hitting people at a subconscious level because as as i said it's archetypal it's using these very strong strong mythic imagination to connect with people at a very primal level These are all very primal themes, which is uh, unusual. As of, uh, after a long time, I found an in- Indian film dealing with such primal stories. So, right. so you know, uh, as you explained, this is very local. So, why do you think you know even the North Indian audience is connecting to this film so much? It's it's such a big hit even in Hindi. No, that's the reason because it's primal. It's dealing with issues like forest and field, nature and culture. um uh, wild and domestic it, 
it is dealing with class issues caste issues without being overt about it it's mm. not in your face it is not saying look 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 this man is a, a caste person or it's not like one of those uh, left uh, you know nftc films where caste is like they will put a billboard saying yeah, oh yeah. this one is upper caste and this one is lower caste they have not said it it's all very subtly done and that's the subtlety is uh, amazing yes. and the primal nature of the deity the primal nature of the deity and of course the music is beautiful the sound is beautiful the camera work is beautiful all that works all that has the craftsmanship is extremely good but i think also the south indian films have are connecting with roots now they going to mm. the rural countryside you know uh, bollywood films you know is based based out of ba- i call it bandra mythology it is based on you know people <laughs> who live in bandra and they create a mythology of india based on you know eastern express highway and western express highway <laughs> so they have never heard of villages they have never gone to a forest they don't know what it means to live in a village so this is real village whether it's a pushpa or whether it is a um, kantara these films are looking very real so you don't find that such films being made and it's high budget very beautiful camera work or as i said the craftsmanship remains superlative music is superlative yeah. yes. action scenes are superlative camera work is superlative that is like at, at another level and then the story is very primal as i said mm. hero killing violence uh, you know um, ad- adequate amount of toxic masculinity you know the you know <laughs> mothers are stereotypical the do- women are stereotypical the heroes and the everything is stereo- there's nothing unique or u- new in any of those characters what is new is this go- idea of deity coming in in a very powerful way and i don't think this uh, it is a spectacle right it's a spectacle it uh, and that spectacle with the music everything everybody goes into a trance and i think that's what um, uh you know since i was familiar with it it was a little i mean i was finding the length of the film a bit tedious uh but i guess that's you know the norm for people and i think you you are right you know the subtle touches because there's this beautiful scene i remember where the landlord steps into their house and they show the chappals his royal beautiful yes. chappals among the other you know that ordinary ones so they show them very nicely very subtly across the film no and the thing is that he enters their house and the man says why has he entered a house he wants something <laughs> right because right. they are low caste people he would never come into right. their house he would sit outside on his chair and they would go out yes he has right. come in and he's nice to them they know that he has come for something so the caste is brought out in that scene the caste is brought out when he enters their house when someone entering their house has been beaten up the boundary is continuously reminded the fact that gomutra is used when he is eating with him there is this discomfort when he touches him he washes his hand there are hmm. at least seven or eight instances where caste is shown yeah yeah uh, but as i said not shown in this very oh he is low caste or he is high caste the way north indian or bollywood films would do right also one interesting thing i um, noticed is of course you know low caste and class is both there and one of the group one one from shivas group is also a muslim right the person who yes. you know strikes the crackers yeah. so that's also interestingly no, put no that's also dark humor right that he's dealing with explosives <laughs> so there is a dark humor over there <laughs> so I, i i found it very dark humor there because you know he is exploding the bombs so what are they it's very funny but dark and, you know uh, i think that's where the genius of the filmmaker lies he is he's mischievous but he's also making a point but he's also talking about secularism but he's not denying certain things so he's 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 a clever filmmaker i think he's he knows how to negotiate with different groups of people and maybe as i said either he does it strategically or intuitively we would know Right. Yeah, I want to, to talk about uh, this motif of forest as well. You know, the forest in the, the name itself is like Kantara, uh, which means mythical forest, I guess. And they say a legend. So, what do you think? You know, why did they include this legend as a you know kind of a underlining this name? So, the word legend is used for fantastic stories with political implications. so ramayan also becomes a legend because it is a fantastic story with political implications otherwise it would come into the realm of mythology because people it's based on belief or faith 
so uh, but he is telling you the legend of this god so he's not telling you it's fact he's very clearly saying it's not a factual film it's a legend it's based on belief which has political implications mm-hmm. which is a very as i said again a very smart move in the tempo but the forest is in, in indian philosophy everything begins with the forest while in islamic and christian ideas everything begins with nothingness in the beginning there was nothing and then there was god and then the world comes into being mm. in indian thought it always begins with the forest so everything begins with the forest and even the samaveda is divided into forest poetry and settlement poetry aranyagan and gramagan so this separation of forest and field is a very primal indian idea it's a global idea really but in india it's a very important idea the wild spaces where shiva is associated and the domestic spaces where vishnu is expected and the borderline and in many ways it's the wild boar that connects the two because he is the wild animal and in the in the domesticated species it becomes the domestic pig right and we also see shiva you know cutting down the trees killing the same boars but then you know the forest also comes in his rescue also the demigod talks to him so we were also getting these questions or these ideas about you know the is, is the film not supporting the balance of the ecosystem why do we celebrate the hero cutting down trees and killing animals and we still but, have yeah if you want to talk about that Yeah. how do tribal communities live if they don't cut down trees if yeah. they don't uh, kill wild animals so this is very urban elitist view that oh cutting down trees but how do you build a house without cutting down a tree what do you eat you will you know you will have to hunters foragers will eat wild animals what else will they eat so this is perfectly uh, you know what how they live they have lived like this for thousands of years it is society which has told you know come in and created these laws and industry which has come in and destroyed the ecosystem why should they be punished for what industries do and lastly uh, devdati if you want to talk about um, you know this tumbar kantara debate that has started very recently <laughs> i think for the last two days what do you feel about that because tumbar is also one film which we really love you know one of our favorite films in the recent past but your feelings about this I don't know I think it is sometimes you just feel these are manufactured arguments because they get attention <laughs> to old films and help their ratings go up uh, but in terms of craftsmanship for me personally uh, Kantara is a better crafted film Tumbad while while visually spectacular is not rooted in culture it is you know there are, uh, for anybody who is a Marathi Brahmin uh, which it sort of you know it talks about the brahmanical community over there also but it is a little uh, theatrical and stereotypical not archetypal so mm. this is archetypal this is very local it's very parochial it is very uh, tulu nadu it's very kannada made by phil kannada filmmakers by kannada filmmakers with kannada actors so it's very local and it is very archetypal that is why it is universal appeal while well, for me tumbad uh, was trying to talk about a uh, brahmin uh, households it was based on uh, i think certain marathi films which show a particular kind of brahminical background but it was for me it was a little there were a lot of um, small small because i'm familiar with the marathi brahmin family uh, films that influenced tumbad but what was beautiful is the magnificent way in which it met- metaphorically presented the greed Mm, and it right. showed it, it with that house and entering that 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 monster who you know excretes gold and how greed takes away the decency of people and you know the uh, so it had a more anti brahmanical stance in a way it was very in your face anti brahmanism uh very in your face uh, this was not in your face at all the subtlety yeah, in kantara is was shockingly brilliant i was like really uh, impressed by the way it dealt with politics without screaming which is how normal films do all the vulgarity and the toxic masculinity was common vocabulary of commercial cinema unfortunately but that works for the audience i think it's a very uh, in terms of craftsmanship there's a lot in kantara which i think tumbad aspired for but could not quite get at a craftsmanship level it aspired for it but i mean some of the shots the visuals were just 
outstanding. I mean, it's just. Uh, but as as I said, as someone who's familiar with the Marathi Brahmin community, I was like, the art director needed a little bit more work. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. don't know whether they were Marathi Brahmins, and therefore I think when you are an outsider trying to, it's like me, a non-Bengali trying to make a film on Bengalis. You know, if you see yeah. Sanjay Leela Bansali's Devdas, very beautiful, but it's based in Karnataka. The house is <laughs> is a Kannada house. It is not a Bengali uh, Thakur Badi. So yeah. anybody who understands art will know that Sanjay Leela Bansali's. not done or uh, if you look at his uh, but he's operatic right he's operatic he uses a different vocabulary uh, so even if he does not do devadas in a bengali house or you still find the spectacle of bengal or if you do uh, if you see the what is that marathi movie what is that bajirao bajirao mastani and that is marathi splendor but no maharashtrian would like it but it's brilliantly done and executed very well so right, right. Um, he does he does it operatically so that's his vocabulary so i think every filmmaker must has their own vocabulary of presenting it sanjay leela bansali is a operatic vocabulary so tumbad yes i mean it's a good film but i don't think a great film but for me kantara has the makings of a great film very commercial but yet very as i said the ending is a mysterious you really don't know it's a happy ending or a sad ending it's trying to show something i like the the uh, so those things are uh, good i think it makes you think the kind of the, the fact that people are having conversations on it even tumbad made people have conversations on it that's what art is supposed to do um so these are good films um that people you know making people aware of culture and i think it's refined and sophisticated despite the you know pedestrian narratives on television I think these films are making you think on fundamental issues. If you are willing to think, and not just oh, this is Hinduism or mm. this is atheism and superstition, those are very right. childish conversations. Is there any any reference, uh, mythological reference to this uh, end uh, sequence where the father and the son meets in the jungle? No, no, no. That's a storytelling technique. It's a trope, and it's, I think uh, gives him an opportunity to create a sequel. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But it is also magical. Right, there's a magic yes. thing about what happened, the sun disappearing, and where do they go? So it's there's something magical, and I think that a, a good story always has that sort of a magic realism happening over there. I mean, the moment Salman Rushdie does it, it's magic realism. The moment it is done in <laughs> Tulu Nadu, it is so superstition, dramatic. So you know, yeah, Salman true. Rushdie can do people falling from a plane but rising up, and uh, people find it perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. Right. Right. Um I think uh, we are at the end of the conversation uh, Devdhi ji and uh, we are so glad that you were here and you cleared so many doubts uh, in our minds which was there about the movie and also you came up with such uh, brilliant explanations and it's always a pleasure to listen to you anyways yes, indeed, yes. so thank you so much sir thank you so much for so joining us people want today. to know I just want to uh, tell you about this book I wrote Garud Puran where I've talked about the bhutas Okay, so you pay. You know, I okay. did, I did a little bit on the. I don't know if you can see it on the visuals, but uh, the camera. But I, you know, I, I I was surprised when this film came out because we published this book, hmm. and I was like, people have never heard of Bhuta Kola. I thought I was writing the book to help them understand, but this film beat beat me to it. <laughs> right, sure, right. Sure. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure more and more people will now be interested in the book, sir, and they will they will learn about Bhuta Kola, <laughs> and. Uh, Thank you, thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Thank Always you. a pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.